Galatians chapter 3, turn there. We're going to finish Galatians 3 today, hopefully. Move into Galatians 4. But that's the, that's the, more or less the concept behind what Paul said here. I looked the word up. Um, if you've ever heard of the word pedagogue, anybody ever heard of that word? Okay. Uh, I heard it a couple times in, in college. Um, it has to do with how a teacher would uh, compel students to do their work or to learn things, but it actually had the root of the word. I like to study where these words come from. The root of the word was like you know, back 2,000 years ago, the kids that went to school were the rich kids. Poor kids didn't go to school. So the rich kids, there would be a servant who would uh, walk the children to school. He would accompany them and basically stay there with them and made sure they stayed in school and then accompany them back home. So it had to do with this idea that the children were going to be compelled to go to school. Um, little history question, history trivia. Who was it in American history that came up with the idea of compulsory public education that children in America had to go to school? Who, who came up with that idea? JR, do you know? Callie, do you know? Oh, come on. Everybody learns this, right, Melissa? I'm sure my sister Melissa knows. What? Who came up with the idea, though, to put it in the Constitution? Cubby? Do what? No. Mm -mm. Well, okay, you're thinking of the, the old deluder Satan law before America was a nation... In some, and I can't remember what colony it was, Massachusetts probably, that they, they passed a law when, Amer when Massachusetts was still a colony called the Old Deluder Satan Law that said any, any um, community over 50 households had to have a public school. So, and the idea was so that the deluder Satan, you cannot, he cannot lie to people who can read the Bible. That was the idea behind it. And, and so, but no, Benjamin Franklin. You were going to say that, weren't you, Mom? You were going to, she said, right here on the tip of my, right on the tip of her Walmart teeth. All right. So anyway, um, but yeah, it was Benjamin Franklin. Because the idea that the history of mankind was that ignorant people are easy to rule over. Because you can tell them anything in the world and they don't know the difference. Which is why John Wycliffe wanted to have the Bible translated into English. This was back 1400, 1500, somewhere around in there. He was a Catholic priest that saw the abuses of Rome on the people. And he said, these people need to know that what they're being told by the priest is not in the Bible. So I'm going to translate the Bible in English for them so they can hear the word of God in their own tongue. Because at the time, even when the word of God was read in the churches, it was read in Latin. And only the rich, educated people knew what it was saying. The poor people who did not go to school were left in darkness. So Tyndale or John Wycliffe, uh, the old deluder Satan law, Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin was not a Christian, but he got it. He understood it. He knew that the abuses of power that came from tyrants throughout history, they got away with it because people were ignorant. And they didn't know how to read. And so he said, if we're going to have a free society, we need to educate people Teach them how to read and write and think for themselves. Which is why you have to learn algebra. Because you have to learn how to think. You have to learn how to think for yourself. All right, Galatians 3. Enough of the history lesson. 
Um, but God is in this. My people shall be destroyed for a lack of knowledge, he said. So it's a, it's an idea that, that even God wants. All right. Galatians 3, 24. So the, the purpose of the law, people ask me this all the time. So if, you know, if the Ten Com if we're not under the law anymore, what's the purpose of the Old Testament? What's the purpose of the law? Uh, we've already looked at the idea that the law is there to increase the number of sins possible so that grace could be seen as overcoming all possibility of sins. All manner of sins that's in our flesh, grace covers it all. So to increase sin. But then, verse 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. That's the word. And it, and it carries with it this idea of a teacher who has a rod in his hand, a staff of correction, and he compels these young minds, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from them. That's the idea. The idea is to put them under cruel authority, mean authority, one where they can't, they can't wiggle their way out. They can't they can't cry and or be lazy. They are going to be compelled to do that work whether they like it or not. Um, people who didn't have the opportunity to go to school or to finish school as a young person, a lot of them as adults, they say, you know what, I want to go back. I want to finish school. No child ever thinks that way, but an adult does. Why? Because we grow up. We learn what's needful in life we learn how to be responsible for ourselves and so that's the difference between old testament new testament old testament says you do it because you have to new testament says i'm going to do it anyway i'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do so the law is our schoolmaster mean tough there's no it doesn't bend it doesn't break it's not made of clay you can't bend and shape it however you want to, which seems to be the modern translations. Because they are ever changing. Um, I don't think it was Henry Ford. Henry Ford, when he started making the automobile, for years made the Model T. And it was the same car year after year. And after a while, car sales started going down. Why? Well, there was, if I already have a Model T, there's no need for me to buy another one. So somebody came up with the idea, why don't we change it? Why don't we make the engine better? Why don't we put a better, why don't we put a radio in it? Why don't we put this in it? Why don't we change this? And somebody came up with the idea of having a difference between years, model years, so that somebody who's got a car would look at the new one and say, well, I don't have that. And they would go and they would want a new one. Okay? That's what, and, and that's what came up. Anyway, I'm rambling. But anyway, but the laws our schoolmasters designed to compel us and drive us to the cross. That's why God had to be, had to give us these rubs. Talking about the new translations. The idea is if we keep changing the Bible, we'll give people an, uh, an incentive to want to buy a new Bible, even if they already have a new Bible, we'll change it in five years. Now they'll have to buy a new one to keep up with it. Pastors, and because they've written down copyright rules, pastors who are putting their verses up on the screen they have to get permission from whoever publishes that Bible. They must get permission to do it. And in some cases, not all, but in some cases pay a royalty for it. So if they change the Bible every so often, then they have to get these new Bibles and new permissions for it. But it and it's the same way with the Southern Baptist Convention. Southern Baptist Convention for years published their Sunday School literature, the King James. Then they started publishing their literature with NIV. Because they didn't want the King James anymore. So that now they went to NIV. But they were paying Zondervan Press all these royalties 
to print the NIV in all of their literature. So they said, why are we paying Zondervan when we have enough colleges and universities in the Southern Baptist Convention, why don't we come up with our own Bible that Holman Publishing Company owns, which is Southern Baptist, that we don't have to pay anybody royalties, we keep it all for ourselves. And that's why, and you gotta understand that the, what's the difference between the NIV and the, and the Holman? Well, the copyright rules say it has to be significantly different in order for you to have your own version of it it has to be significantly different. And so they can't, and that, that right there should tell you, they're not translating it to keep it faithful to the original languages. They're translating it to change it significantly from what all the other Bibles are saying out there, including the King James, which has no copyright outside of the United Kingdom. So it's that, that idea of, the word of God being made out of clay, that way we can change it and mold it every few years to fit what we believe or to fit what we want or to sell new copies of it. And when God sent the Ten Commandments down, he had them written in stone, written on both sides of the tablets. That way you could not add to it. You cannot take away from it. When God sent his rules down, they were not made to be broken. Somebody say amen. So that's the purpose of it. And by the way, you can have all the laws you want, but if you have no enforcement of the law, the law is meaningless. Right? So, if God sends down these rules from heaven, but then doesn't have any means by way he can enforce those rules. How do you enforce rules? You, uh, you inflict punishment for those rules. They elected themselves a liberal prosecutor up in St. Louis who the day he took office said... I will no longer take anybody in charged with marijuana possession. I'll no longer prosecute those cases. So what, is, what did he just do? He legalized marijuana in St. Louis. Legalized it by saying, I'm not going to punish anybody who's got it. Okay? They elected him. They can have him. Okay? But that's what they did. Um, and you've got that stuff going on. You've got the sanctuary cities like San Francisco, Nancy Pelosi, telling everybody, we want all the immigrants to come to our city. We will not chase you down. We will not prosecute you. And I want to tell you something. You, you might say, well, they're just being kind to them. No, they're not. Because what's going to happen is the businesses and the companies up there who know that they're not going to get raided for hiring illegals, will hire illegals, not pay them the minimum wage. And what you are in bringing into your area is a de facto form of slavery. Because these people can't complain because they're not here legally. And they won't get the rights that other citizens have. And you're setting up a form of slavery. The love of money really is the root of all evil. Somebody say amen. But God sends down his rules down here. And he says, if you break them, I will kill you. If you break my, my rules and my laws and my statutes and my judgments, then I will drive you out of the land. I'll take your own land away from you and I'll give it to your enemies. And if you read Leviticus 26, God says, if you break my statutes, I'll give you seven judgments. And he said, after the seven judgments, if that won't, I'll give you seven more. And if that doesn't change you, I will give you seven more. At no point does God ever say, I'm not going to punish you for anything. That's not who God is. Not even us who live in the New Testament live under grace. We still are punished by the hand of God for our transgressions. We are chastised. We're not given the punishment we deserve. But we're given a punishment necessary to make us think God is serious and I don't ever want to go through that again. I keep thinking of, mom, I keep thinking of Uncle Jay who wanted to quit smoking. He was a truck driver, 
wanted to quit smoking. So he checks in, this is back in the 80s, so he checks in a clinic. You remember that? And he got this big bowl of cigarette butts and ashes all wetted down. Had him hold his head over it. Chain smoked, 10 lucky strike unfiltered cigarettes. And he said his shoes came up flying out of his mouth. He vomited so hard and so bad. What was the purpose of that? To change his thinking. His mind then equates the next cigarette he lights with the sickening stench of what he had. Huh? It worked. It, I'm telling you, God knows us. When God applies a rod of correction to us, God changes us. Amen? So wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. Notice this. He's given you the definition to bring us unto Christ. That was the purpose of it. That we might be justified. And where's Christ? He's at the cross. It is to compel us to the cross. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Why? We don't need it. We don't need someone to make us do everything right. It's in our heart. We want to do right. For ye, verse 26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And, he's, and when we get to chapter 4, he's going to give an illustration of the difference between being born under the law and being born under grace. And it's through Hagar and Ishmael and Sarah and Isaac. Let me give you a, a biblical example what I'm talking about. Turn to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. Now, I've said this many times before. But it's a good lesson to learn. Anything that God does to you, He does for you. Everything. Every trial, every hardship, every chastening, is not without God teaching you a lesson of some kind or God shaping you, God molding you. A blacksmith has to use a hammer because even hot iron is still hard. He must use a hammer. He must force the, the, the iron in shape. And that's who we are. Must be forced into shape, must be forged, must be taken through the fire, must be tempered. All of these things are examples. But it, how did God get us to the cross? Did he always speak kind and softly to us and say, now if you don't behave, I don't know what I'm going to do. Is that God? Was that, is that how God did it? No. God was a schoolmaster. He spoke with authority. He wasn't smiling. It wasn't a joke. He wasn't kidding. This is another thing that uh, gets me. Is the cops will go out and arrest people and the judge and turn them right back loose again and say, now don't you do that no more because that's bad. So what do they do? When they leave court, they're going by a drug house to get more drugs. And to buy somebody else's urine to pass the test. Am I right? So Exodus 14. Here's how God. I mean everything that God did through the wilderness. Was God trying to break Israel. Of their stubborn heart. And with most of them it didn't work. God realized. That they were reprobate. Probation is a term we apply to those. They've done something wrong. We will reduce their sentence and put them on probation. And during that probation, it's meant to see whether or not they will change voluntarily. And if they won't, then we must put them back into prison 
to force the change or to keep them away from the rest of society. That's how it's supposed to work. So Exodus 14, here's the lesson that God was doing. I'll never forget when I caught on to this. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Ziphon, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. If you look at a map, it's not that far to get from Goshen to Jerusalem. It doesn't take that long. Even when you're walking, 600,000 plus people, it should take maybe a month at best. But instead of them just curving up and going north, God stopped them and said, turn. Take this passage here between the mountains, one road in, and... We think we know pretty much where they crossed because underneath the Red Sea there's a unique sort of land bridge and the sea just isn't as deep as it is in other places. And those two little fingers there are the Red Sea. To me the Red Sea looks like this. Okay? And they're crossing and there's, a, there's an encampment there. There's a place on the beach and it's pretty much the only place for hundreds of miles that you could put almost three quarters of a million people and camp them there. And God said, turn, go through here and camp by the Red Sea. God put them there. In verse 3, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And I want you to understand who Pharaoh is. Pharaoh is, Pharaoh is Wayne Shirk. No. Pharaoh is the devil. Number one. Number two. Pharaoh is your sins. Your lust. Your greed, your pride, that's who Pharaoh is. And Pharaoh is chasing you. All the days of your life, he's chasing you. But what is he doing? God is using Pharaoh to compel Israel to cry out and trust in God. I mean, probably at some point, somebody would have figured out isn't the promised land that way? We could be up there in a few weeks. Why don't we just go and do this on our own? Now, you guys listen to me. Especially you home church people. God bless you. Many of you are very faithful. They're pretty much every service. And I want to commend you for that. Because I'm not so sure that if I didn't have a church anywhere in my area to go to and I was home churching, I know my lazy attitude. It would probably take everything I had to make myself, unless God did something in me, to make myself get online Every time we had service, I'm just being dead honest. So some of you folks, I don't know how you do it, but you do it. And it's probably like I said, you do it because you want to. You do it because you don't have another choice. But it would be easy to say, I hold church and then not do it. Because, I mean, who's going to know about it, right? I mean, I don't know who, exactly who's online. I don't know who's doing what. It would be easy to live a lie. And it would be easy for you to say, I don't need church. I can be, you, you can say what a lot of people out here say. I don't think I have to go to church to be a Christian. Right? Right? I don't think I, I think I can do this on my own without having help. 
God says you can't. God is the one who said to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Okay? As the manner of some is. Meaning God already knows those who are faking and believing their own lies and okay with God while they're not attending service with other saints. God knows you cannot. You're not designed to do it on your own. So, that's why God said, Moses, have them turn. Go over here to the camp. Because I want... It, 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 follow this now. God's already done this before. What he used to save Israel is the same thing he used to destroy their enemies. God's already done this before. What God used to save Noah was the same thing he used to, to, to destroy the rest of the world. And that was the flood. What do you need a boat for if you don't have any water? What good is a boat? All you got is a house. Okay? So Moses, Noah builds this thing. And what saves him is the rising of the water. But that's what destroys everything else. And notice in both of these stories, God is using water as the destruction. Okay, so verse 8. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Pharaoh wakes up and he says, what was I thinking? I let him go. I'm going to go out after him. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army. Underline that army. Study that, study that phrase, army. Because it dawned on me one day. I bet God's got an army of devils. And I, that's when I started looking at Joel's army. Because you got all these new apostolic reformation people and all these Kansas City prophets and all these weird, wacky people like Todd Bentley telling everybody we're Joel's army. We're the mighty army of God that's going to take over the world. We're the ones that are going, going to go in the windows like a thief and we're the ones that you can't kill us. We're the, and they called themselves the new breed. New breed. New DNA. Keep that in mind. So when I started studying Joel and looking at that army, I noticed that they were very close in appearance to what comes up out of the pit in Revelation 9. And I went, that's the army. And it's not saints. It's devils. And God, listen, God is in charge of everything including satan and you get all these charismatics telling you that satan's more powerful you got to release god because satan can open it. no he can't satan can only do what god allows him to do if god don't allow him to do it he don't do it so god is in charge even of the evil army it was when the angel come falls down when the star falls down from heaven with the key in his hand how do you think he got the key he didn't steal it. It was given to him. Jesus is the one who was holding the keys. I hold the keys to hell and death. And so, here comes the star falling from heaven and he's got the key. Who gave it to him? God did. He opens the pit. Had God not want the pit open, the pit would have never been opened. Period. But God wanted it open. He's letting loose this army. And that army's coming. Um, I don't know if I want to say this or not. Yeah, I do. There's an article on Drudge Report right now uh, from the New York Times who never, almost never publishes stories about UFOs saying that it seems like these UFO appearances are increasing. It's on, the, it's on Drudge Report right now. I've got it saved. Okay, and I've got a copy of uh, National Geographic up there. And the headline article is, we are not alone. 
I'm telling you, they're getting people used to something coming. And it's going to be an army of very evil angels that will appear as the saviors of this earth and the world's going to fall for it. Okay? So when you think, of, when you think about this, think, think Bible. So verse 9 again, his horsemen and his army oh, and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Pihahiroth before Baal Zephon. God allowed that to happen. God allowed that to happen. Now, uh, look at verse, uh, look at verse 10. When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them and they were sore afraid and the children of Israel, what did they do? They cried out unto the Lord. Take that, go study Psalms with that. David said, I cried unto the Lord. I cried unto the Lord. I cried out to the Lord. In my, in my fear, in my misery, I cried unto God. Why did God allow that fear and that misery? Why did God, when they, somebody will tell you it's a sin to be afraid. No, it's not a sin to be afraid. David said, David, who wasn't even afraid of Goliath, said, what time I am afraid, I will call on thee. So why does God allow sickness to hit us or disease? Why does God allow suffering? Why does God allow tribulation? Why does God allow us to get in the trap of sin again? After we've said, I don't want to do this anymore. Why does God allow that to happen? It's the schoolmaster making sure that we learn the lesson we're supposed to learn. Amen. So they cried out unto the Lord, but, but look at what, how they cried. Verse 11, they said unto Moses, they're, now, notice they're getting a little snarky here. Because there were no graves in Egypt, thou hast taken us away to die in the wilderness. Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. These people have been too used to being in slavery. And let me tell you something. I mean, I love people. I want people to be saved. But I think there's people that get so used to living in sin that they cannot, they absolutely cannot even fathom the idea of ever being free again. And when you offer them the freedom of salvation, you offer them, hey, God will change you. God will take this stuff away from you. God will do that. They spend the rest of their life telling themselves no to God because they're afraid it won't work. When I went to talk to Mike Henderson, me and you was with me that night. Mike sat and argued with me for an hour and a half. And what he said was right. He said, Mike, you know me. I've been in a church, out of church. Back in, back out, back in, back out. I've done this all my life. And he said, here you are telling me I need to get back in again. And what's going through my head is, yeah, you'll get in there. Then you go do something stupid again. You be right back out again. So he said, why should I even start this process all over again? And I'm just going, you know, he's right. That's all that's ever happened with him. And he got up. He had to go to the bathroom. And I said, Lord, you're going to have to give me something to say to him that he won't argue with. And I'm not kidding you. When he come back, we talked for about five minutes. And I said something to him. And wham, he said, you got me. I'll be there Sunday. And he didn't even wait for Sunday. He said, the next night, he said, I got on my face before God. Cried my eyes out. He came down to the altar that Sunday. He was carving. He was the guy that was... Showing me all these little craft things he was doing. And he had a piece of wood. He was carving out this image. I'm not kidding you. It was a spirit on this plaque of wood. And he kept saying to me, I keep seeing this in my mind. And I'm drawing, carving this out. But he said, for some reason, I can't see the face. And I said, that's the spirit. That's the devil, Mike, that's got you in his power. And you're not going to see his face. And you don't want to either. And he froze. He knew exactly, he, he knew I was right. And he said, I need to get rid of this. I said, I'd burn it if I were you. If it'll burn, I'd burn it. 
But that's what he did. And uh, I didn't have to say nothing to him a week later, cut his big old long ponytail. I mean, he got right. Okay? But that's, that's what God's doing. God, we come up with excuses why it won't work. And God says, will you just trust me? Notice now they're complaining to God. Have you ever done that? But look at what God did anyway. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see what? The salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall, underline this verse in your Bible, the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Second Chronicles 20, the battle is not yours, but it is God's battle to fight. Of course you cannot defeat your own sin. Of course, you cannot lead yourself into heaven. You cannot do it. You are not capable of doing it. God must lead you. In fact, for a while, God has to drive you. Because where is God at this point? God has led them to the Red Sea, but they're camped there. Where is God? God is in the pillar of the cloud, that, and he is shielding, he is behind Israel, shielding them from Pharaoh and his chariots. God is still protecting them, but Israel does not think in, in their mind that God is going to save them. And what is he going to do? They have no place to go. Here's Pharaoh and the only pass in, into this beach, the only way in is the way we came in. It was... I mean, how hard would it be for Pharaoh to follow 700,000 people's footsteps in the sand? It's not like you need an Indian tracker for this one. So Pharaoh knows exactly where they are and is going to kill them. But then, verse 15, the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore thou unto me speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. That's where we're going, people. Forward. Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind, I press toward the mark. Forward, not backward. I'm not going, I am not going back to the days that we used to live. Who wants to? Verse 16, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea. The rod is Christ, divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I heard this theory in Bible college. I don't think the professor really believed it, but he's just sharing all these, these German theologians came up with all these wacky ideas that there was a marshy area of the Red Sea that during seasons of the year had very little water in it. So that must have been what happened that they were just happened to be there at this certain place at the right amount of time so that God led them through this, through about three inches of water and they got to the other side. That in itself is a miracle because apparently God drowned Pharaoh in three inches of water. See, they're just stupid when they just don't believe the Bible. Amen. But look at verse uh, 17. I will, and I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. And they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots, upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh and upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. Pharaoh's the Antichrist. That God has a date set to meet him in the valley of Megiddo. The battle of Armageddon. God himself is setting everything up in this world. You think the devil's doing all this? He's not smart enough. The devil is just doing what God wants done. And the devil is get, uh, turn to, um, turn to Psalm 12. I know I read this for a reason. Psalm 12. This is why I tell you to go to the Psalms all the time. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, and with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. That's most of your preachers nowadays. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. 
who have said, with our tongue will we prevail, our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, that's us. Now will I arise, saith the Lord, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Read your Bible. When you are surrounded, read this psalm again. God's not going to let harm come to you. Even if he does, he's going to reward you with heaven. So what are we worried about? And I'm not preaching this to anybody except me. Because I sit and worry and worry and worry. I worry about my family. I worry about my children, my grandchildren. I worry about this church. I worry about people I care about. God, are we going to make it? God, I don't, want, I don't want all this stuff going on in the world. God, I don't want to see this affect my family. I don't want to see this inflicted upon my grandchildren. God, I don't want to see this. And I sit and worry. So I'm taking my medicine this morning. My anti-anxiety psalm. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And verse 8 says, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. And he's, what that means is we're surrounded. We are surrounded with evil. Most of them are congressmen. They're going, to start a, they're going to start a fight. They're going to start a war in this country. Okay? And uh, I'm not necessarily looking forward to that, but something's got to give somewhere. So, I mean, you know the story. They were surrounded. They were trapped. The purpose of this was to trap them. To take Israel and lead them into a trap. And who led them there? God did. Why? Schoolmaster. I'm going to make sure you learn what I want you to learn. I'm going to make sure. I'm going to let your enemies beat on you until you're tired of it. And when you're tired of it and you call upon me, then I will help you, but I will also teach you how to fight. I will teach your hands to know warfare so that a bow of steel is broken in your hands. God said, I will not let any of the plans of the enemy prevail against you. He's either going to protect us or he's going to teach us how to fight one or the other. And it's a lesson I have always needed to learn. Because when you get tired of the devil beating on you, beating on your family, beating on your church people when you get sick and tired of it you rise up and do something about it amen let's go to the lord that's galatians 3 next sunday we'll start galatians 4 you study ahead of me study study these things listen to what god's let god talk to you all week and then come back to sunday school and learn some things Father, I'm never, never done learning from this Bible. Never, God, am I done learning the lessons. And I thank you for them. I need the medicine. I need to remember that I still have a God. I still have a Savior. One who abides with me. One who has never left me. One who has never forsaken me. Father, when days when I'm in fear, I come to you. God, when I get lazy, don't do what I'm supposed to do. You let the enemies reproach me to re put me back in my place where I need to be. Father, I thank you for that. I need you. My wife needs you. All my family needs you. All this church and all these people need you, Father. Thank you for being hard on us and forcing us to the cross or we surely would have perished by now. Thank you for your word. Teach us some good lessons. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.